Thank you, Wendy. Um, the first part, um, which will probably be about 45 minutes, um, is my uh, attempt at giving a scholarly um, examination of inquiry and inquiry-based teacher education. Um, uh, and of course, within that, there always becomes uh, a little bit of a critique. But I wouldn't be a scholar if I didn't do that. Um, and then, if we have time after questioning, uh, questions, etc., I'll go into some uh, activities. But I don't want to take more of your time than I, I really should. Um, I want to go very quickly over the first part because this is something which I've already written about in the literature and uh, I want to use it as a setting because um, it was in 2007 when I first used William Butler Yeats' poem The Second Coming to characterize these three different periods of teacher education, research and policy in Canada. And my premise was that these two factors of research and policy had influenced practice between 1960 and 1980 to focus on direct instruction and classroom management between 1980 and 2000 or thereabouts on reflective practice, inquiry and social justice and between approximately 1990, an overlap with the second one, and 2010 on content-based instruction and on-the-job learning. And so what I'm trying to picture here is the context in which inquiry started. It essentially started in phase two which came as a reaction to phase one where the emphasis was on classroom management, direct instruction, uh, etc. Uh, vestiges of which we still have in teacher education programs. It came in the emphasis of learning to teach. Teachers were here to learn how to teach. It was in opposition or in contradistinction to the uh, Nation at Risk report in 1983 and suddenly the language then was learning to teach or Schoen's reflective practice all replaced uh, teacher training and teacher uh, direct instruction. It's at that stage then in the development of teacher education that um, inquiry-based teacher education became all the rage. It's at that stage as well when institutional governance became to the fore. In the first period, it was under government control, but government control was so benign that essentially it was a form of institutional control. When we entered the third phase, teacher education was being thought of differently as a policy question, and the governance context was a comp competition between professionalization on the one hand and deregulation on the other, deregulation bringing in all sorts of competing alternative routes to teacher education. But the governance side also emphasized professional regulation and in particular professional self-regulation. And in uh, British Columbia we happen to have a pro professional self-regulating body um, which was um, important indeed um, but in 2014, many of the existing professional bodies no longer exist except for one or two in Scotland and in Australia and the Ontario College still exists but a lot of the others have been dissolved and most of them now are actually uh, closely monitored by government uh, and the governments themselves have become the regulatory bodies and directly control teacher education programs. So I have no doubt that the next era of teacher education, which has just begun, will include an extreme focus on outcomes, leading to a neoliberalist purging of those programs that take little account of what they produce. So how do we engage outcomes? We must get involved and engage the conversation. We need to be responsible and responsive to the concerns of the public, to acknowledge the exigencies of public policy and to preserve complexity in the press for accountability. Being accountable while honouring complexity will involve us all in a fruitful conversation about non-trivial outcomes 
And here I'm quoting Marilyn Cochran Smith. What is needed and generally missing from the discourse so far are discussions of outcomes measures that ironically make teaching harder and more complicated rather than easier and more straightforward. Such measures would recognize the inevitable complexity and uncertainty of teaching and learning and acknowledge the fact that there are often competing co and concurrent claims to justice operating in the decisions cooperate prospective teachers must make from moment to moment, day to day. The new teacher education ought to make room for discussions about outcomes that demonstrate how teachers know when and what their students have learned as well as how they manage dilemmas and wrestle with multiple perspectives. Outcomes ought to include how prospective teachers open their practice to public critique and utilize their own and others' research to generate new questions as well as new analyses and actions. They ought to include how prospective teachers learn to be educators as well as activists by working in the company of mentors who are also engaged in larger movements for social change, end of quote. Holding ourselves accountable then in the new era while honoring complexity will inevitably involve us in the renewal of programs. We have attempted to do this here at UBC by framing the CREATE program around inquiry. But what form of inquiry have we pursued? Is it a focus on beliefs, knowledge and experiences that pre-service teachers bring with them into teacher education? Is it a preoccupation with outcomes or is it a mix of both? If we focus only on the beliefs, knowledge and experiences that pre-service teachers bring with them into the teacher education program, then we are back in the 80s. Inquiry-based teacher education 30 years on requires us to focus on outcomes. So what does this mean then? What constitutes inquiry in the early 21st century with an outcomes focus? Inquiry always deals with substantive content within a social context. The substantive nature of the exercise consists of either disciplinary content or interdisciplinary themes. The context is framed by the varied social, cultural, political situations in which teaching takes place. Inquiry has never been possible without consideration of both content and context. Thirty years on, it cannot happen without attention to outcomes. In the 1980s, as a result of the burgeoning emphasis on constructivism at the time, inquiry focused on pre-service teachers' beliefs, values and dispositions. This focus, however, was largely on personal rather than professional commitments and actions, which led to a preoccupation with the kinds of predispositions that teacher educators should look for in order to admit candidates. This, in turn, resulted in most attempts at improving teacher education being framed around structural interventions. For example, lengthening the teacher education programs, as has happened in Ontario. Or creating alternative routes, as has happened in the States. Or altering three credit courses to one credit and two credits, as I believe has happened somewhere. I want to argue that the teacher education curriculum must be the focus of any change and that the curriculum focus must be on inquiry into subject matter, knowledge and practice with a view to demonstrating that professional preparation makes a veritable difference over personal qualities and prior experience in how teachers eventually teach in classrooms. Hence, the primary purpose of teacher education is to prepare students for the specialized work of teaching in a manner that improves considerably on what can be learned through experience alone. Claudia Rutenberg, our own faculty, has addressed this matter as well in a 2011 publication when she differentiated between predispositions, that is value commitments that a person may or may not act upon, and professional dispositions, characteristics attributed to a person based on actually observed actions. And she claimed 
that teacher education programs should focus their attention on the latter, not the former. For Rutenberg, the important question is not whether student teachers have the right personal beliefs, but whether, if the dispositions required by the profession are at odds with their personal beliefs, the former will override the latter. Inquiry-based te teacher education, therefore, cannot focus solely or even primarily on addressing prior experiences, predispositions and value commitments that pre-service teachers bring into the professional preparation program. Why? Because the form, that form of teaching is very loosely conceived of as helping other people do specific tasks. The kind of teaching that parents do and many other people do quite regularly. Professional classroom teaching, however, is a highly specialized, intricate work that is separate and distinct from what non-professionals naturally do when they're helping other human beings. Grossman and colleagues put it this way, quote, learning how to build and maintain productive professional relationships with the people in one's care is no simple matter. Yet many assume that this is natural rather than a learned capacity. Someone can be described as good with people or a people person, but being good with people in purely social interactions is not the same as cultivating relationships in a professional role, end of quote. To put it differently, the work of teaching is neither natural nor intuitive. To listen to others closely in order to probe their ideas and identify key understandings and sometimes misunderstandings requires much closer attention than most people by nature afford their friends or family members in everyday life. Moreover, to set out purposefully to provoke discrepant thinking or errors in argument with a friend or a loved one would seem somewhat bizarre and make for many awkward moments in a personal relationship. To teach, however, as Margaret Bookman has said, is to shift the locus of one's role from the personal to the professional. Even though teaching as helping others is a common activity, becoming or being a teacher is to join a practice community in which the work of teaching is highly specialized, intricate and professional. Decisions by, taken by teachers have to be based not on personal preferences or intuition, but on professionally warranted knowledge and on the moral imperatives of the role. Hence, the outcomes that inquiry-based teacher education must be working toward in the 21st century are to be framed around the unnatural and specifically professional ways of relating to the creation of learning opportunities for all children and the moral imper imperatives of being a professional teacher. As I said previously, inquiry has never been possible without consideration of both content and context. Thirty years on, it cannot happen without attention to outcomes. Discipline-based inquiry must result in new understandings of existing disciplinary norms and or the, the creation of new knowledge. Interdisciplinary-themed inquiry must result in fresh understandings of wise practice and intelligent action that I previously referred to in 1992 as craft knowledge. Hence, any renewal of a teacher education program around inquiry that fails to take serious account of outcomes in the current era when government control of teacher education is no longer benign is inadvertently making the institution very susceptible to outside intervention if not harsh imposition. The year is 2014, not 1984. In 2014 we live in much more Orwellian times than we did during the actual year of 1984. Thus, to claim that we frame a program around inquiry means that we must be prepared to teach against the grain, to quote Marilyn Cochran Smith again, and encourage difference and diversity of thought. Dogmatism and inquiry make strange bed partners. While inquiry has its commonplaces, it also frustrates a desire for conformist structure and supine action. Rather, it focuses on the attainment of inclusive community responsive pedagogies 
that is situated in the public personal dialectic between the transformation of individual values, worldviews, ethics and practice, and the social, cultural and structural factors that mediate equity and access and opportunity in educational systems. What it must do in 2014, in addition to encouraging difference and diversity of thought, is to focus on outcomes. Outcomes of learning, outcomes of inquiry, such as wise practice that understands the uncertainty of abstract knowledge and the importance of intelligent action in the classroom. Anne Phelan put it this way, inquiry-based teacher education promotes an exploration of concrete particulars as the route to wise practice, becoming more open to practice itself as a site of learning helping aspiring teachers to appreciate the fragility of knowledge, the epistemological value of feeling, and the priority of the particular in teaching. Gert Biester and Nick Verbalis, Gert was here last year, also assert that the purposeful practice of inquiry is to transform actions into intelligent action. Hence, an important outcome of inquiry in 2014 is the extent to which inquiring teachers display intelligent actions in their relationship with content, context and learners. The outcomes of wise practice and intelligent action complement outcomes framed around inquiry grounded in the Persian notion of communities of discipline-based inquiry being engaged in the construction of knowledge. Berg and Nichols comment on this Persian notion in the following way. Integral to the method, quote, integral to the method of the community of, of, of inquiry is the ability of classroom teacher to actively engage in the theories and practices of discipline-based communities of inquiry so as to become informed by the norms of the disciplines not only to aspire to competence within the disciplines but also to develop habits of self-correction for reconstructing those same norms when faced with novel problems and solutions. In 2014 then, a disciplinary approach to inquiry leads to the development of habits of self-correction in order to reconstruct those norms of the discipline when faced with a novel problem and solution. When conducted well, this kind of disciplinary inquiry typically leads to an interdisciplinary preoccupation with wise practice and intelligent action through a careful examination of the social, cultural and structural fac factors that mediate equity across educational systems. Hence, teacher educators need to prepare teachers disposed to draw on the accrued knowledge of the profession, for example, the wisdom of practice, and to contextualize their thinking for the challenges of each specific workplace around the disciplinary and or interdisciplinary content under study. Cochrane and, and Smith and Lytle refer to this as an inquiry as stance, asserting working from an inquiry stance involves a continual process of making current arrangements problematic, questioning the ways knowledge and people are constructed evaluated and used, and assuming that part of the practitioners individually and collectively, part of their work is to participate in educational and social change." Unquote. So this notion of inquiry as stance in teacher education is distinct from the more common notion of inquiry as project, which treats inquiry as a time-bound activity within a teacher education course. Inquiry as stance represents a mindset that is infused into every aspect of teacher education. Its purpose is to cultivate the habits of mind, values or ground rules of a particular discipline or practice and both that make up the distinctive perspectives that are exhibited by that discipline and or practice. And it goes without saying that these habits of mind vary across the disciplines and practices. And so I just very quickly, because I'm going to go through this section, um, want to show you some of the different ways of inquiry. We have philosophical inquiry, and I've already cited uh, Claudia's work. She has two other pieces as well, and I just happened to know Claudia's work because she and I were colleagues uh, at uh, uh, that little schoolhouse on the hill. Um, uh, historical 
Peter Cetius's work, um, his book with Tom Morton as well on uh, the six um, things in history uh, is very important. Historical <coughs> criti critical interpretive <coughs> inquiry in the prize winning uh, piece by uh, Clark, Gleason and Petrina. And um, Wayne Ross as well has really um, taken a fairly critical perspective on social studies and its role in the uh, K through 12 curriculum. But there's also scientific inquiry. We've got Marina Milner-Bolton's work in chemistry, uh, the work of Nashorn, Nielsen and Petrina on um, whatever happened to SDS, which I found out from Samson the other night, means um, science, technology and society. Um, there's lots of work then in this going on. Um, artistic interpretive, that's, those are two graduate students in EDCP, um, Elsa Cote and Marie-France Bérard, um, doing lots of things in artistic interpretive work, then Peter Gazouis and R Rita Irwin, um, and Donal O'Donoghue, I'm just picking things in flavour, but there's also Scott Goebel's book on what's uh, best in teacher, in music education, what is it, where he proposes an, a vision for how music education should take place. Um, there's moral in inquiry, religious inquiry. The only people I could think of there are people like Parker Palmer, who've been actually involved or used by people in teacher education. Um, Parker Palmer, of course, is a Quaker who actually writes about the way in which we relate to one another as human beings. The interpretive um, is where people are actually attempting to make sense of people's lived experience as reported by them. And we've got a number of uh, 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 research uh, aspects where this inquiry has come to the fore. Joy Butler's uh, examination of teaching games for understanding uh, Samson and David Anderson in their interpretation of students' uh, views of, of science in, in Kenya. And then a disciplinary moral interpretive action inquiry in the form of Anne Phelan, who's actually at this point studying something to do with English, um, as well as the actual wisdom of practice in her 2009. Um, there's an instrumental approach to inquiry, which actually is the kind where you just try and find the best possible way of actually bringing something to bear and then repeating it. Uh, and fortunately, I didn't find anybody in this faculty who did inquiry in that way. I can think of two people, though, and for them I have considerable critique. One is Donald Cruikshank. He's an old guy who used to be at Ohio State who wrote in the early days on reflective practice, and it was always a way of how you can get from A to B. There was nothing complex or problematic. And then action research. I don't know whether any of you ever remember Richard Sager. Uh, but Dick Sager really spoiled action research because he made it into an instrumental way in which teachers could actually get involved in school improvement by collecting data and analyzing it, but not for the purposes of making it problematic or critiquing, but in for the reification of the existing status quo. Um, there's deliberative, and the person that comes to mind in terms of that is Amy Gut Gutman, Deliberative inquiry is when you don't really know. You're faced with a forced choice and many different uh, possibilities and you have to decide amongst the various options. And uh, Amy Gutman has written about deliberative inquiry and democracy, a very, a very important book. And then you've got action, interpretive action inquiry. And one of the studies I found was by uh, Shatri and Tony. Um, I said it that way because I can't pronounce Shatri's last name. Um, self-study, which is very, very prevalent in teacher education today, where people are studying their own practice and bringing things to the fore, which is a very, very powerful form of inquiry. Uh, and Anne has done that as well in one of her pieces toward a complicated conversation, showing, showing how turning to curriculum actually has a, an effect on our understanding of teacher education. And then there's this last one as well about the teacher education conversation, which Wendy Nielsen headed up, but essentially involved uh, Valerie Triggs and um, uh, Tony as well. Um, so a lot of things are happening. 
And um, it's always dangerous when I actually pinpoint um, research of, of people because there'll be somebody else who'll come along and say, oh, you didn't include mine. Um, and so to those people, I apologize. Um, I did find that Wendy had done something on flags uh, and French immersion, and I think that that's a, another interesting sort of and very worthy and laudable approach because we need to expand on our French uh, teacher education program. But let me move on because I want to get to the, the real gist of what I want to say. Uh, you can notice between those, if you look very closely, that those ten methods, the first six or so are more disciplinary, the latter four are more interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary. And where, whereas each one works toward different and distinctive outcomes, they all have similar general outcomes. An important general outcome of inquiry is that it produces useful knowledge about natural and humanly designed worlds. It sheds light on how these worlds are organized and on how they change and interrelate. And it provokes us to think about how do we communicate about, within, and across these worlds. To address these questions, however, we must ground inquiry-based preparation around content and context in a manner that triggers the generative processes of questioning and searching as a way of constructing new understandings and new knowledge as expected value-added outcomes. But this cannot be done without first setting a conceptual context for inquiry. And this is really what I want to talk about. I don't want to sort of slow this down, so I'm going to put them all up there so you can go ahead if you need to. It's impossible to consider doing inquiry without consideration of content and context. Moreover, it's impossible to enact inquiry without paying attention to the different dimensions of content and context that are central to a conceptual context for inquiry. Duchel, in two publications in 2003 and 2008, conceptualized the cognitive dimension of inquiry-based teaching around three categories. One, conceptual structures and cognitive processes. Two, epistemic structures and uh, in used in developing and evaluating knowledge. And three, social interactions that shape how knowledge is communicated, represented and argued. The dimensions of content have three um, to them. The conceptual domain consists of knowledge, theories and principles of the discipline. All inquiry activities within a discipline take place within an orienting framework of conceptual knowledge connected not only to students' prior experiences and knowledge but also to the more sophisticated understandings that are expected to emerge from classroom interaction. Hence, the inquiry process of the discipline is embedded within the content it seeks to enrich. The epistemic domain is based on students' understanding how disciplinary knowledge is created. The evidence that students collect from their own disciplinary investigations plays a paramount role here. Through evaluation and interpretation of the quality of the evidence they have collected, Students then forge explanations for what they have observed and or experienced. Instructors thus ac accustom students to the process of collecting, evaluating and interpreting evidence that is similar to the practice of scholars in that particular discipline. With the proviso that disciplinary knowledge is always subject to change when new evidence or new interpretations of old evidence appear. The social domain consists of the collaborative and communicative processes by which disciplinary knowledge is constructed. These are the social processes involved in communicating disciplinary ideas and understandings which emphasize the importance of students making public their ideas through articulation, argument and other modes of representation to help them learn to examine their own nascent understanding of the discipline in question. Dimensions of context. Dewey is well known for his propounding of an inquiry-based vision of teaching. For Dewey, the fundamental feature of science was that its method is effective, of in, uh, effective method of inquiry into any subject matter. 
He advocated a model of inquiry based on experimental science, which he applied to both matters of value and matters of fact. Put differently, inquiry-based teaching demands a form of pedagogy that is itself a process of inquiry, suggesting, as Bill Dahl in 2002 has done, not, quote, dialogic, di didactic imposition, but communal development, unquote. A, de a development and that supports and sustains an ev evolutionary epistemology. A process of inquiry constituting an ev evolutionary epistemology thus involves the passing on of tacit knowledge, which is a very complex undertaking. Hence, one dimension of context in inquiry is that such pedagogy must be understood as an informal mode of instruction through which skills, capacities and dispositions are passed along within a domain of practice. Hence, an inquiry-based pedagogy consists of knowledge that is largely tacit in nature and contextually embedded in shared practice. This is where the scaffolding of inquiry comes in. This complex undertaking also emphasizes a second dimension of context, a procedural one, or one that addresses the methods of inquiry, or as Bruner actually called it in 1961 in his famous, or perhaps now infamous book, The Process of Inquiry. He called it the heuristics of discovery. This would focus on the particular and specific directions given to students in carrying out the inquiry. That is, directions addressing the kinds of questions they need to frame, the procedures they need to follow, the form of representations of evidence and interpretation they should be collecting and creating, etc. This is quite different from a common misconception that views teaching as inquiry-based when it consists only of hands-on, student-led activities engaged in independently. That does not constitute inquiry teaching because it ignores important dimensions of context. There is an important role for instructors to play in providing an appropriate context for student and inquiry learning. Duncan and company articulated the need for teacher educators to provide scaffolded contexts for developing teachers' abilities to critique, adapt, and in and design inquiry-based materials. So one of the features that they're saying is really important if we're teaching inquiry to would-be teachers is to teach them how to critique, adapt, and in design inquiry-based materials. And Forbes 2013 suggested that pre-service teachers need to be taught how to adapt existing curriculum materials to plan and enact inquiry-based teaching. A third dimension of context entails a critique of those social-cultural factors that really mediate across the educational system. Such a critique involves a critical examination of lived experience, describing a particular situation, appraising how and why it came to be this way, and powerfully pursuing the question of whose interests are and are not being served by the way things are currently constituted, so that the situation can be reconstituted in a way that addresses its inequities. And I found three examples of this kind of research going on in the faculty. One by Don Krug with a partner, Journey of in Critical Inquiry and Professional Learning, Telling Tales of Community Arts, Aesthetics and Cultures, one by Deirdre Kelly, um, a critical inquiry and an anti-oppressive approach to teacher education. And one by Teresa Rogers and Elizabeth Mar uh, Marshall, Elizabeth is a former colleague of mine at SFU too, on the road examining self-representation and discourses of homelessness in young adult texts. And one of the, the ways in which, for instance, I'll take the last one, is critical is they unpack the way in which in those texts the definition or understanding of homelessness is somehow connected to blaming the victim. And they, they free in that critical analysis the notion of homelessness 
from the context that's in being built in actual texts designed for adolescents in schools to suggest that we need to reconsider that and that it may in fact not be the, the, the outcome of a person's choice but that there are other ways of understanding what homelessness actually means. And so with these there's also not only a critical element but it's also an attempt to bring some kind of understanding and compassion into the understanding of would-be teachers. So I want to talk then about scaffolding the conceptual context of inqu inquiry. Thus far I've talked about the ten forms of inquiry that on a continuum fall into ten, two broad approaches. Those that concern themselves with the disciplines and those that concern themselves with practice in an interdisciplinary fashion. Let me elaborate on these two broad approaches to inquiry by addressing the following questions. Why is inquiry teaching difficult? Why do inquiry-oriented teachers have particular difficulty with the focus on outcomes? Why is it typically easier to focus on the process of inquiry? And how do we scaffold the conceptual context of inquiry to ensure that a focus on outcomes becomes possible? Now, Krauss reviewed the literature in 2008 and found the following factors constituted barriers to inquiry-based teaching. Time, teacher knowledge of content, teacher knowledge of inquiry, pressure of high-stakes testing where it exists, adequacy of resources, and conflict in learning styles. Most of these reflect a general focus on the implementation of inquiry at a surface level. I want to focus on two of them, teacher knowledge of content, teacher knowledge of inquiry because they permit us to look more deeply inside the implementation by examining how teachers prepare the content and context of inquiry. I contend that a lack of teacher capacity and capability in knowledge of content and knowledge of inquiry makes for most difficulty in teaching because it inhibits the requisite scaffolding of the inquiry uh, context. Let me explain. David Cantor, in a very Im important piece in 2010, found three inherent challenges in preparing for disciplinary-based teaching, disciplinary-based inquiry teaching. One was creating a need on the part of the learner for unfamiliar content. Two was ensuring that all the target content is useful for completing the inquiry task. And three, accommodating the time gaps between the introduction of and work with content. Let me talk about them briefly in turn. Creating a demand for unfamiliar content on the part of the learner. In many instances, the requisite content for undertaking the inquiry is unfamiliar to students. Consequently, many students cannot easily see how working with this unfamiliar content would be useful in conducting the inquiry. Teachers, however, are aware of how important such content could be to provoking questions and insights. So an initial challenge for teachers is to create a demand. But teachers cannot create such a demand by telling students to trust them because they would eventually need such content for the inquiry activity. Rather, students have to have the opportunity to work through for themselves that a certain content would be useful for performing the activity itself well. Cantor suggests a step that he calls highlighting the incongruity giving the example of how students were measuring the f energy contained in food and the teacher posed questions about the process of oxidation. Almost seemed as if he was off on left field. But he posed the questions on oxidation because oxygen is both needed and consumed during both processes of combustion and respiration. Thereby, he was attempting to create a demand in students to study oxidation as a prerequisite way of understanding how to measure the energy that food adds to the body. Ensuring that all target content is useful for completing the task. The example given for this was that students who are attempting to measure the food that, that adds to the body 
were asked to devise their own school lunch and activity cho choices to meet their body's energy needs. This involved them in taking a measurement of what their lunch food adds to their bodies and also measuring the energy that their activities would draw out. Fortunately, these kinds of people can do things at lunchtime. I wish I could experiment in that way myself. This, in turn, gave a focus to using the target content about levels of biological org organization, how the body's organs and organ systems work together to provide cells with food and oxygen for energy and cellular respiration. And the third one he talks about is accommodating the time gaps between the introduction of and the work with content. This challenge has to do with ensuring that any work done with unfamiliar content as part of the inquiry journey toward completing the set task must be undertaken in a timely manner. The teacher cannot permit the inquiry process to become sidetracked by the pursuit of new and unfamiliar content if students do not grasp quickly the relationship between the unfamiliar content and the actual task they've been set to inquire. So Cantor's attempt at framing science inquiry, because that's the discipline in which he's working, it sheds light on what he calls design challenges. It leads us to understand that we need to look more deeply at how teachers and teacher educators prepare the content and context of inquiry. But it does not go far enough, in my view, in addressing the question of how to scaffold the conceptual context of inquiry, particularly in both disciplinary and interdisciplinary conceptual contexts. I want to put forward three principles for scaffolding the context. One, context is important and makes a difference. Two, content is constructed and therefore open to interpretation. And three, the paradox of clarity and messiness in the articulation of meaningful tasks. Let me talk about context first. Context is important because no two contexts are ever alike. Each context brings with it a particular cultural capital. Not only are teachers and students influenced by context, but context may also provide the impetus and purposefulness, or lack thereof, for doing inquiry in the first place. So we attend to context because that's the culture in which inquiry takes place. For example, we experience events differently dependent upon the setting in which we find ourselves. Being present at the scene of an accident is very different from watching a video of the same accident on the news. Thus the meaning of inquiry is frequently contingent on the context that is set by the teacher. Context is also social. The social context is a myriad of systemic embedded cultural processes that influence our perception and understanding of the world. These influences are typically ascribed gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality or class, etc. They may be achieved, it's a position in the hierarchy or maybe some sporting achievement is distinctive and they also vary over time. Hence the historical and contemp contemporary dimensions of social context are vital. Contexts change. People's positions within context also change. Inquiry teachers therefore need to take account of context for students to engage in the activities of instruction. For inquiry thrives on contention and contention always happens in a social context. Inquiry teachers need to hook students into respectful contention. Content is interpretable. When planning for inquiry, we have to have interpretable content. Why? Because content and knowledge is always constructed in social settings. Hence, the social context in which knowledge and or contact is constructed also provides a myriad of possible alternate interpretations. 
this interpretive flexibility may be problematic for teacher control if you're from the first era of classroom management, but it is also what makes inquiry non-trivial. For inquiry to proceed, there must be variability in the form of complexity and messiness in the content that is presented. Thus, content needs to be presented in a manner that permits and encourages different and diverse interpretations that spawn the generation of powerful questions. Such presentation requires that the information that the students are given to work with contain complexities, discrepancies and uncertainties. The prospect of contention around information provided inevitably provo provokes students to appreciate the context anew. And then the final principle, authentic tasks with paradoxically clear and messy information. To these two principles I want to add a third about the task set to evoke inquiry. A meaningful inquiry typically emerges from a task that students struggle with. But a meaningful experience seldom emerges if students cannot relate to the task at all. Put differently, an appropriate task is one that has both complexity and accessibility in balance. A task that typically has some authentic connection to the real world that students indwell. Hence the choice of task in the scaffolding of the conceptual context of inquiry is as important as attunement and adherence to the principles of content and context. Moreover, the choice of task is replete with the expectation to hook students into the inquiry process. Thus the information in used to introduce the task and the directions given for filling it have to be carefully chosen. If the task and its procedures are too complex and messy at the outset, there's a possibility that students will not engage. So the levels of complexity and messiness must be introduced slowly, like imperceptibly raising the water level in the stream encountering a log jam. Some of you will recognize that metaphor in my writing. In order to forge connection, we begin with clarity and an authentic hook. Put differently, we, dem we create a demand for unfamiliar content that will enable students to engage the inquiry task. In order to raise the level of inquiry, we introduce discrepancies and uncertainty through the unfamiliar and messy content so that the initial clarity, once it has served its purpose of engaging students, does not lead to a trammeled process. And we monitor the, clo the process closely to ensure that any targeted content introduced is dealt with in a timely manner so that it does not distract students from the designated purpose and focus of the inquiry task. These three principles, I believe, are applicable to inquiry that is both disciplinary and interdisciplinary in nature. They address the fundamental paradox of inquiry. R. D. Lang cleverly characterized how we deal with it in inauthentic ways. I'm coming to an end. There's something I don't know that I'm supposed to know. I don't know what it is I don't know, and yet I'm supposed to know, and I feel I look stupid if I seem both not to know it and not know what it is I don't know. Therefore, I pretend I know it. This is nerve-wracking. Since I don't know what it is I must, what I, what I must pretend to know, Therefore, I pretend I know everything. Inquiry that does not feature content, context and task, I believe, leads to this kind of spurious self-confidence that emphasizes personal attributes, such as vacuous arrogance, instead of professional actions that spawn learning opportunities. Highly specialized knowledge about the intricate nature of professional teaching comes from grappling with what we do not yet understand. Socrates provoked Meno to grasp the quintessential feature of the paradox of learning a new competence. 
The paradox of learning in really new competence is this, that students cannot at first understand what they really need to learn, can only learn it by educating themselves through self-discovery or inquiry, and can only educate themselves by beginning to do what they do not yet understand, and then thinking about it. For me, regardless of whether disciplinary or interdisciplinary, the fundamental paradox of inquiry is that one cannot build new knowledge without using existing knowledge. That is, the paradox lies in an appreciation that to construct new understandings and knowledge requires appropriately chosen, often contentious content with which students work on non-trivial, authentic tasks that arouse disagreement within a supportive social context that itself influences the process and becomes a focus of critique. If the inquiry is discipline, disciplinary, then the content must include exposure to the discursive practices of the disciplines in question. If the inquiry is interdisciplinary, then the content must include exposure to the discursive practices of the professional knowledge of teaching. While inquiry as an intuitive process is practiced by many, teaching inquiry to students does not come naturally but has to be learned. When we frame teacher preparation around inquiry, we are committed to inducting pre-service teachers into the practice community in which the work of teaching is highly specialized, intricate and professional. So today in 2014, we practice a form of inquiry that is focused on outcomes. A disciplinary approach leads to the development of habits of self-correction in order to reconstruct the norms of the discipline when faced with novel problems and solutions. When conducted well, it leads to interdisciplinary inquiry about practice, wise practice and intelligent action. So we need to prepare teachers in this way. And my firm contention is that this form of rigorous inquiry becomes possible and workable when teachers understand how to scaffold the context, the conceptual context of inquiry by attending to content, task and context, regardless of its disciplinary or interdisciplinary focus. Thank you. Now, those of you who need to disappear, you may, but I'm open to questions and then I wanted to, I have three examples that I could actually share with you but we'll get to that if we have time, and I don't want to force or impose anything on anyone. Any questions? So, Peter, just the, uh, the, the phrases, and I might have got it wrong, inquiry teaching and inquiry-based teacher education, mm -hmm. are they the two phrases that you use? Yeah. Can, can you just, the distinction between those two for you? Well, inquiry teaching is what we want our teachers to do when they're in the classrooms in schools. Inquiry-based teacher education is where we're attempting to induct them into the practices and understandings that accompany inquiry teaching. Okay, thank right? You. And I'm, I guess if I'm being perfectly frank, that's a, I should say candid in this faculty, uh, perfectly <laughs> candid, um, I'm not entirely convinced that we know how to induct people to inquiry teaching as a form of their rigorous preparation while they're in our midst. I think that is what is flowing through my paper and it is not a, a criticism of any one particular program or institution. I think it's just a critique of the state of affairs. We are being expected now to focus on outcomes, we have to have ways in which we can understand what viable outcomes are that come out of the process of inquiry, inducting teachers into inquiry teaching, which is what inquiry-based teacher education is, so that we can then actually herald those outcomes and demonstrate how and when and where we are actually achieving them. 
And if we could actually do that and articulate it and explicate it in a way, I think we could shout that from the rooftops, we could get that out into the media, and I think we would have a lot of students who would want to come to this place because this is where inquiry-based teacher education takes place. And one of the concerns um, I have about inquiry-based teacher education it's very similar to the concern I had about reflective teacher education. Um, it, there's a tendency, it can become co-opted because it, it, it's kind of like it's trending. Um, and reflective teacher education, as it was implemented in the States in the 1990s, actually killed any sense of the kind of spontane spontaneity that was inherent in Schoen's conception of reflection in action. It was, uh, it was just the next thing since sliced bread and people were actually practicing, oh, our program now is reflective teacher education. But they had no way of demonstrating, the reason why I know this is because I was a reviewer of a book on reflective teacher education which examined ten different programs in the States in the 90s and for the life of me, I did it with Ken Zeichner, for the life of both of us, we couldn't understand how these programs were even reflective in the slightest. And so I bring the same caution about inquiry-based teacher education. It's one thing to um, get with the trend. It's another thing to understand very perceptively and very profoundly how you actually induct people into that way of teaching. It's a way of being. Inquiry is a way of being. So we're actually saying we want to induct people into a way of professional being, which will separate them out from other teachers, which also separates them out. We, we always work to separate them out from other people who would actually engage in informal teaching uh, such as parents do and such as sort of youth workers and uh, anyone who engages in teaching sort of other people things. We're people who actually take the moral imperatives of our role as professionals very, very seriously. And that, of course, is why um, the professional self-regulatory bodies were first set up to ensure that those kinds of standards and moral codes were upheld and of course it's now in the hands of government and it will be upheld and the number of disciplinary cases in the TRB o over the um, past two years have gone up exponentially to what it used to be under the BC College of Teachers suggesting then, as far as the government is concerned, the primary focus and function of regulation is to sort out the people who are not fulfilling the moral imperatives of their professional role. So, I'm trying to say, we're, we're in a different era. And in that era, there is no room for being sloppy or even unknowing about the things that we proclaim that we're doing. We have to know them very deeply and very perceptively so that we can make the case for them in a compelling way and also defend the practices that we are using. And that's really what I'm trying to say. We need to understand what we mean much more deeply when we claim that we're inquiry-based. But I'm also <coughs> saying I think we need to look very, very closely at how we actually induct people into inquiry because it's much more complex than meets the eye. Didn't mean to speak so long. Sorry. Other questions? Peter. Oh, okay. Yeah. I need a, you can go first. Go mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about the timeline because I, I, I can see that it's important to maybe make things simple at first mm -hmm. and then add get used to even going into the into the practicums and yeah. then coming back and going back and forth. But I'm concerned that there isn't enough time mm -hmm. to go from the simple to the complex and that it, it takes a bit of experience to yeah. 
be aware of the complexity? Well, there are two um, broad levels on which we have to go from the simple to the complex. One is over the period of a preparation program. The other is intrinsic to an inquiry task, yeah. right? And I think we have to think through very carefully how we go from uh, the simple to the complex. Over the we have to do this in conversations together, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of the, the how things, uh, uh, the transitions work out in the course of the program. Um, I'm not, I haven't been party to any of those conversations, so I don't know to what extent they, ha they happen here. But that's certainly what I would want to sort of see happen um, in any program, wherever. But in terms of w when an individual teacher is inducting students into inquiry, I, I think you have to understand the task and the content and appreciate the context extremely well so that you can almost develop the art of knowing when you move toward more complex information, when the students are ready, that the, their, their whole thinking can be um, messed up. But it's got to be, um, it's got to be carefully um, constructed because one of our moral imperatives is not to mess students up. We only mess up the co task context so that it actually um, it, it, it produces the motivation for them to resolve the, um, the, the, the what, what's it called, sort of the, um, well, I'm thinking of music now, when two notes come together and then you have the resolution of that. What's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what's, what's the musical term? I've forgotten it. Well, from, yeah, when you resolu re resolve the dissonance, the resolution of the dissonance, right? So it, the same thing actually happens in teaching. You, you can introduce some dissonance, but you have to ensure that you give students the, the wherewithal to resolve it as well, to their own satisfaction. But sometimes you want to leave them as well with an unresolved situation which provokes more questions. Um, and it, this is all part of how we act as knowing inquirers when we're teachers. It would seem to me that in, in a classroom there will be different way, uh, degrees to which you can provoke different students too, because yeah. we're all capable of taking some dramatic at one given time. That's right. That's where the social context becomes very important, because you may in fact have a social context where you determine that they're not ready yet for that kind of messiness to be introduced. On other occasions, you may in fact see that uh, they're ready for it. Um, uh, classroom social context is not that different from the social context of an academic unit. You have to know when you can actually introduce discrepant information for the purposes of generating discussion and debate and when, in fact, that would not work because people aren't ready for it or people have got a particular agenda where they distract and take it off. Um, and that can always happen in the classroom. You have to know your social context. Who actually is uh, one of... Who, who are the informal opinion leaders? How will they respond to it? Uh, and sometimes those are the people whom you've got to get on side in a particular contentious setting in the classroom so that in fact it goes according, it keeps a, a focus on task, right? You got this on tape? Yes. <laughs> we got yes. this on tape? Of course. Yes, we do. Yes. Yes. It's the <laughs> off-the-cuff remarks which always gives things away, eh? So I'd like to keep the suspension going. Yeah. Um, a series of you cited uh, the paper that I co-authored with Rita mm -hmm. and two pre-service teachers who became teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, much of what you say resonates with what was in the paper. Uh, people coming into this notion of inquiry with a very strong arts background and then uh, engaging with a form of inquiry, that inquiry which was arts-based yeah. inquiry. Mm -hmm. So their understanding of their artistic backgrounds blended with arts-based inquiry made it a very powerful thing 
um, and that they there were at least three points where the student where, where these teachers reflected on their their inquiries. One was while they were actually pre-service teachers um, when they first did the inquiry, mm -hmm. not knowing then that later on in their practicum they would apply that which they inquired upon mm -hmm. in their practicum. Mm -hmm. And then a year later when they came back and revisited and uh, when I interviewed them and asked them to reflect on mm -hmm. those two stages of the pr of two stages of the process as well as where they were at now mm -hmm. and everything you're saying um, uh, about process the need for the content the product um, is so true um, and that the people who were engaged with teaching inquiry myself bringing experts like George Velvo and Rita and mm -hmm. uh, um, Don Donald O'Donohue and uh, Carl Lego and a few others in to, um, to work with the pre-service teachers to give them a taste of what it was all about and having cohort leaders like Anne-Marie Lamond and uh, uh, Colleen Maven who worked with me for the first three years um, taught me so much in terms of what was necessary to, to set the frame mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that it did never worked as well the last two years, it didn't work as well because we, we didn't have the frame, um, we didn't have this, uh, the people, the kind of deep understanding that the, the, that the professors, the instructors need to bring to the process with strong content backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It just fell apart. So I see that happening. I can see that happening yeah. more frequently than not. Um, uh, you know, the tension not being able to be resolved, and uh, yeah. because the, the the expertise isn't there to lead the process along. Yeah, you've introduced another concept which I actually didn't use, but do subscribe to, and that is you do have to have some content expertise to lead inquiry well. Um, you, you, you can't lead inquiry into something you know very little about unless of course you're attempting to learn from the people who are inquiring in which I think you're on a bound to make that explicit but if you are the teacher students typically um, expect you to bring some expertise to the uh, the setting as well and that one type of inquiry can't be prescribed no but there are many different types of inquiry so depending on the instructors expertise or mm -hmm. instructors, uh, what they bring to the endeavor um, uh, needs to be um, understood and, um, and proliferated. Yeah, uh, you see, I, one of the things which I'm really keen on is to, um, I guess, attempt to eradicate the division between disciplinary and interdisciplinary inquiry. I think both are forms of the same sort of um, process and in my own way of thinking lead into the other. Um, so if disciplinary um, inquiry does not somehow lead in education to a grappling with questions of practice then I want to um, be a critical friend in that situation. But I also want to be a critical friend with the person who only wants to examine practice and somehow, um, largely I guess because of the R.D. Lang sort of factor, doesn't <coughs> want to engage in any kind of discipline. Um, our, our history in our disciplines always come with us and infuse the present. And even if our main preoccupation in the present is with inquiry into practice, which is what is true of my, myself, um, or it used to be um, before I became a head, um, then I cannot suddenly make as if the disciplinary backgrounds that I was trained in 
don't exist. That's almost akin to suggesting that um, when I when I came across from Britain to Canada, I changed cultures like I was taking off a shirt and putting a new one on. It doesn't work that way. Who you are shapes you, forms you, and then imperceptibly changes you. So now I'm horribly in that mid-Atlantic phase where people can recognize I speak like a Brit, but the British people particularly recognize I don't think like them, and thank goodness for that. Uh, and I think what, what is, that is an analogous in a certain sense. You, you work, we all have discipline backgrounds, and we want to work that disciplinary focus into a concern with interdisciplinary themes about wise practice. And I want, uh, what I'm really trying to say is, I dislike pe people setting up adversarial conditions between the two, because I think they all go together as forms of inquiry. <coughs> and some people will have different emphases at different times in their careers, but all of those emphases are very important. And particularly, I think, for those areas of a school system where subject matter expertise is important. So, for example, if I take French as an example, if you're going to inquire into French and you are not a Francophone speaker, it seems to me that's going to be very difficult work to do. But the people who are actually learning to become French teachers will want to have an inquiry that actually assists them in expanding their already existing knowledge of French, French literature, French philosophy, etc. And so inquiry in with those kinds of people is to take them through the discipline that they need to have because that's what they need to get the jobs that they want but also then leading them through that into a preoccupation with wise action in the classroom. And one of the difficulties that we've faced in BC, we're finally now getting out of it, is that a lot of the early days of French immersion teachers were people plucked from Quebec into British Columbia without any teacher preparation in either province and therefore the only thing they had going for them was in fact content expertise and their manner with children left sometimes a lot to be desired. And it's unfortunate that that's what happens when we divide discipline knowledge as distinct from pedagogical knowledge and we need to bring the two together. And that's essentially what inquiry enables us to do. Uh, Shulman coined the phrase pedagogical content knowledge. It has all sorts of difficulties conceptually, but it is in fact a good way of trying to grapple with what we're, we're working towards in teacher education. We want to bring the knowledge that comes out of the disciplines into pedagogical ways of connecting with the minds of learners. And I believe inquiry is central to that. Well, that's probably a really good place mm -hmm. yeah. um, for us to thank Peter for provoking us because that's what he promised he would do and that's what he has done, uh, and pushing our thinking about inquiry to a, a, a broader place, a deeper place, and that we have a lot of work to do, Peter. And you know that, and that's why you, you came to talk to us. So, on behalf of the Year of Teacher Education, please join me in thanking Dr. Griffin. If you, um, if you want to see, I won't actually go into a workshop with you, but um, I've got three examples of inquiry. Um, this is one in mathematics. Um, you can just read it. And the, the purpose of this one is to get people out of the mindset of a 10-base numbering system. 
and it's to get them to play with numbers by substituting different symbols, because the number is a symbol, so you put a different symbol in there and you actually change the number base so that they can begin to understand the thinking that is behind what is taken for granted in our numbering system, right? And, I mean, along with that you have to sort of put in, uh, you need some blocks as well so that people can play around. But can you see what uh, the blocks are doing? Um, and the whole point of it is um, to get at periodicity and place value. <coughs> and it's to teach this. That's really what a number is. Do you understand what it's saying? The place value is in the middle, and on either side of it, the numbers, whether they're algebraic, numerical, or what, are all by the power to n, which is re represents number. That's something if you want to get people to play with numbers, right? And the idea is to introduce inquiry playfully, so that people can play with in mental and intellectual agility. Um, this one um, is, is more of, um, of a hook, right, in English. Um, this is one story. Yeah, can I switch to the second story? It's introducing something which they have to study in a playful way that enables them to inquire into it and have fun, but while actually having fun, they're doing some real hard thinking, right? Um, and this last one is interdisciplinary, and it's one that I have used as recently as four or five years ago. Um, a quote from Homer about Odysseus. It's actually about teaching what reflexivity is as distinct from reflection. And then takes this poem from Dante. And I use it to teach student teachers hope in differ different and difficult circumstances. When they're faced with the class from hell, how do you find goodness there? And the danger that you have to actually avoid here when you're doing this is you've got to then move them on beyond just their personal predispositions, because some people are more hopeful than others to where this becomes a learned behavior to difficult circumstances, so that you can act professionally when someone is actually really attempting to unravel your um, class or is in your face and is being extremely rude. Because that's one of the things which as teachers we need to learn. And it means we have to learn how to overcome difficult and forbidding circumstances if we're going to maintain that professional composure that is necessary in the classroom. And so that's one of the things which I've, I've used and it gets some very powerful um, responses from student teachers. There you go. <laughs>